Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Prorock and I'm a faculty member at the Department of Computer Science and Technology here at the University of Cambridge, where I direct a research lab that works on multi-agent and multi-robot systems. And so today what I'm going to be talking about is some of the work and algorithms that we've been developing to get robots to work together. So a little bit about what my research lab's mission is all about. So we have this idea that the next wave of computing is going to be about devices that communicate and coordinate. And so we're thinking about developing algorithms that endow autonomous agents with the intelligence that enables them to cooperate and coordinate towards common goals. And this is really backed up by this prediction that in the not so distant future, in the not so distant future, we will be having over a trillion devices worldwide that will be connected in some way or another. So this idea of being able to endow them with algorithms that allow them to work together towards the same common goals whilst sharing incentives is really, really valuable for us to progress in a manner that is useful to us, humanity and society as a whole. So I'd like to talk a little bit about a couple of the applications that we're really excited about and we already see happening in the real world today. A, a couple of these you'll be very familiar with. So logistics and warehouse automation is something that I believe gained a lot of um, popularity or at least um, awareness during the pandemic where we really exploited the fact that we were able to get items delivered to our homes on very short notice. Now, what is not perhaps not so well known, is that many of these systems are backed up and supported by multi-robot systems within the warehouses, where the robots are coordinating and working together to get the produce from where it's stored to the associates that pack the produce into the corresponding boxes and get them shipped to us in no time at all. These processes are actually very complicated if you think about it and the algorithms that we need to develop in order to make these processes seamless are actually quite sophisticated and that is also where some of the work that we've been doing comes into play. Another domain that you might be familiar with um, where robotics and multi-agent systems plays a role is the area of transport. So you might have been hearing of autonomous vehicles or even more sophisticated connected autonomous vehicles where the cars are not only driving autonomously on the highways but they're talking to each other coordinating their 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 navigation so that traffic as a whole is more effective safe and efficient and finally we can also think of agriculture as one really interesting application domain where we're thinking of automating um, agricultural vehicles to not only do the job in a more effective way but also to coordinate so that the way they coverage, cover the fields is more efficient. Now, a little bit further down the line, we're thinking of things such as environmental monitoring, surveillance, construction, and even space applications. And we believe that these areas of app this, these application domains are extremely promising because they tend to be application domains where it's harder to, to, to deploy humans into, to get humans working on, on hand of the problem at the sites um, to do the, or to get the jobs done um, that need to get done. And so these are the various domains that um, within the area of, of robotics we're pretty excited about. Now the key thing here and the commonality across all these various application domains is that by deploying not just one robot but several robots we're actually really gaining um, in terms of the performance that we're hoping to achieve here. And it's not just um, the sum of individual um, robots that is bringing something here, but it's a higher order level of cooperation. It's more than just the sum of the individual parts in terms of performance here that we're really aiming to achieve. So I'd like to um, start off by showing you a little video here that really motivates this problem or this idea that by cooperating, getting robots to cooperate together, we can really achieve more than if we deploy robots that are not cooperating with each other. Now, this video here demonstrates a little experiment that we designed and deployed in my lab um, just two years ago. Now, what you can see here is a miniature highway setup where um, we have 
deployed algorithms on these autonomous vehicles that essentially are mimicking the types of driver behaviors you'd see on the roads today. So egocentric, human-inspired driving behaviors. Now what's happening here is we stopped one of the cars on that inner lane there to create an artificial bottleneck scenario. And what happens is that this bottleneck creates a queue in this miniature highway setup. So the cars that should be flowing freely through traffic actually have to stop behind this um, bottleneck car because they can't safely maneuver um, uh, onto the outer lane to overtake it. Now this is obviously a problem because if you extrapolate this to larger traffic systems, this will boil down to uh, traffic jams with uh, negative repercussions for everybody that's driving on that shared um, highway. Now in this next movie that I'm going to play to you now, we made a change. We made a change to the underlying robot algorithm and the change that we did was we said, now you guys can talk to each other. So the cars are now exploiting communication capabilities to coordinate their navigation plans with one another. And again, we, may, we create this bottleneck scenario and we watch what happens. Now, if you, if, as the movie starts playing again, what you'll see happening is actually really, really subtle. The cars that stop, start to slow down behind the bottleneck are now able to communicate with the cars on the outer lane and negotiate a very subtle change in their speeds so that they can merge into the outer lane in a very safe manner. And the result of this is that there is no longer a queue forming behind the stopped car. And quantitatively, what we showed in this miniature setup here is that the, the throughput of this miniature highway was increased by 35% with this very, very subtle change in the behavior of the robots. And just to highlight this again, this behavior change was really facilitated by the fact that the robots were able to communicate and coordinate with one another. So this is just a little glimpse of the kind of things we can do if we're endowing robots with the ability and also the incentive to talk to one another, to work together towards the same common goals. So this now really brings me to my research mission, which is all about developing the right algorithms to allow robots or autonomous agents to effectively communicate and coordinate with one another. And the three C's that we're aiming to achieve here are coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. Now, it turns out that this problem of devising algorithms to solve coordination is actually quite hard. And it's hard for several reasons. The first reason is that if we an analyze this from a computational perspective, it has been proven that many of these distributed or coordinated decision-making problems is really hard. So in computational terms, we call this class of complexity NP hardness. And this is a difficult um, fact to face because it means that as we scale these systems to many, many robots or to many autonomous agents, we can't actually find solutions for them anymore in reasonable time. And why this is a problem for robotics and for these real life applications that we're targeting is because we can no longer produce solutions in real time as the problem um, conditions change. So, so this is the first challenge that we have to tackle, developing efficient solutions that can be solved in near real time as a function of how the problem is evolving. The next problem is that we don't necessarily want the robots to rely on a centralized computer or on the cloud to tell them what they should be doing. Ideally, locally, they're able to compute all their actions um, based on only what they know about their local neighborhoods, right? So we want the computations to happen in a decentralized manner. Now, because we want these architectures to be decentralized, it means that the robots have to communicate to one another to trans transfer, uh, transfer or convey the critical information that is needed for them to solve the underlying task. Now, the question of what they need to communicate is again a very difficult design question and no principled solutions to date exist that give us a one-shot answer to this question. So that's the second research challenge here. What needs to be communicated amongst the robots so that they can coordinate towards solving these higher order goals?
And the final problem that we need to tackle is that even if we can solve problem one and problem two, the real world happens to be messy and often communication fails or sometimes even robots break or sometimes robots and their computers are compromised and hence these systems as we deploy them don't necessarily behave as we think they will behaving. Our models might not be correct. Our models do not correctly represent reality. And hence we need to, on top of all of these baseline solutions, we need to develop robustness measures, measures that allow our robots to operate when things don't go according to plan. So these are three key challenges that need to be tackled before we really see these systems being deployed for real world applications and solving all the different various problems that I mentioned um, in my previous slides. Now how do we go about solving these problems? Now, in the past, past two decades, many researchers actually, actually tackled this from a, a model-based, a first principles-based approach. Now, it turns out that going down this route is really complicated because you end up designing solutions that only really solve one very specific application and can't be transferred to other problem domains. Now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to leverage machine learning. We're trying to leverage data-driven approaches that give us solutions that we can use to many more different problems in a much more efficient way without having to design sophistic sophisticated algorithms from scratch every time we're facing a new problem. And so this is really the part of the research agenda that my, me and my uh, colleagues, my, the researchers in my lab, are trying to tackle. So let me today highlight a couple of the things I'm excited to show you. So. Um, Various applications within the multi-robot domain have gained a lot of attraction and they are derived from a couple of standard kind of golden um, uh, scenarios that we try to solve in order to demonstrate the progress within the area. Now, these example applications are um, ludic to some extent, playful, and you might consider them um, uh, a toy examples, but solving them is really important for the advancement within the field. And the specific examples I'm going to be talking about are solving the problems of coordinated path planning, solving the problem of cooperative coverage of areas, solving flocking problems, and also solving the problem of formation control. And I'm going to speak a little bit about how we're deploying a specific type of machine learning architecture we call graph neural networks um, to get around the complexity of deploying efficient solutions onto our mobile robots. Now, the first specific case study I want to talk about is the problem of coordinated path planning. Now, what is this problem all about? So, you'll recall I showed you a picture of um, warehouse logistics. Now, in order to solve the pick and place problem in warehouses, you have to first solve the multi-agent pathfinding problem, which essentially means robots or autonomous agents have given origin um, locations, and they're also given destinations. And the robots have to coordinate their path plans to move from their origins to their destinations as quickly and as efficiently as possible without colliding with each other and without driving each other into deadlock positions. Now, this is a really difficult problem computationally, and uh, again, this belongs to a complexity class that doesn't allow us to solve this problem for very large problem instances within reasonable time. And that is why this research problem has um, a attracted a lot of attention from people working in this domain. Now, the question that we want to answer is we want to use our machine learning based approaches to automatically synthesize a decision making policy that is only based on information that robots ha lo have locally. So based on what they can see and receive locally. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to deploy these robots with communication capabilities and with very simple sensors so that they can talk to each other and so that they can see what's going on around themselves within their local field of view. Okay? And we're going to show that we can solve this very hard coordination problem based on this machine learning based solution. 
So how do we actually set up this problem? So it's really, really simple, really. Now, if you can see the panel here that I'm projecting, you s we're, we're zooming in on, on a robot um, that here that has the ID number four. And you can see that that robot there has a goal position it, wanna get, it wants to get to. It doesn't actually know where the goal is, but has a rough idea of, of which direction it should be heading into. It knows where it's starting from, and it can see everything that is contained within this little green zone there. So it can see what other obstacles it has to avoid, and it can see the other agents that it has to avoid. And that agent can, on, can also speak to three other agents that are within its communication range. Now, based on only this information, the policy that we developed for these robots is going to allow it to navigate to its goal position effectively whilst navigating around other agents and avoiding collisions with other agents as well as obstacles. Now, this video here is a result that shows us how our method, which is on the right-hand side, compares to standard optimal solvers, which I'm showing you on the left-hand side. And you'll note that I'm only showing you a video that has, um, I believe, uh, uh, this video here only has 40 agents. And we're showing you, I'm showing you uh, um, this example with only 40 agents, especially because of the reason that as we scale these up, we cannot solve them anymore with optimal solvers. So the videos on the left-hand side are much, much harder to come by as we scale the systems to much larger um, um, problem size instances. Now, qualitatively, what you can see here is that our solution on the right-hand side performs almost equally well as the optimal, best-known solver within the classical computational domain that we know to date. And this is incredibly promising because it means that using a machine learning approach, not only are we now solving the problem in a decentralized manner that scales to arbitrarily large systems, but also it solves with almost the same efficacy and efficiency um, as our currently best known optimal solvers. So this is a really, really exciting result and means that we can now leverage these machine learning based approaches to solve really hard problems at scale. Now, clearly, we're, we're aiming and we're hoping to um, transfer these ideas and these architectures to other domains beyond path planning. And one other problem that we're really interested in solving is the problem of cooper cooperative task solving or cooperative coverage. Now, why this is a really interesting problem is because you can think of cooperative coverage as a problem that applies to many, many different um, domains. For example, environmental monitoring, where you actually want to deploy a, a swarm of robots, for example, that need to cover an area as quickly as possible, either to do simple monitoring or perhaps to um, identify the location of a target or a missing item. Now, the key here is that these robots need to communicate with each other, right? And so those are the lines that you see demonstrated in this little video. And by communicating with one another, they can coordinate how they would best distribute over this area so that they get the coverage task done as quickly as possible. Now, again, from a computational perspective, distributing over this area as effectively as possible whilst coordinating with other robots is a difficult problem. And hence, we're interested in deploying our machine learning based solution to solve or to find more effective ways of solving this problem. Now, what we were interested in is actually a side question in this problem. We were actually interested in thinking about, well, if we're using a machine learning based approach, don't we need to be careful about how we're training our agents to solve this problem? And um, if we give the agents the wrong incentives during their training process within machine learning terms, will that potentially affect the quality of the solution? So this is the question that we were trying to identify in this research study. And the answer to that question was, yes, indeed, we have to be very careful about the incentives that we give our agents as we train them, because if we don't control their incentives, they can actually exploit the fact that they're using a data-driven approach to learn their policies to their own advantage. Now, what you see happening in this movie is that the red agent was actually given an advantage during training. And that red agent learned to exploit that advantage, to learn to communicate stuff to the other agents in the system that was manipulative. So the messages that the red agent is sending is similar to what you would potentially do if you knew that you would gain a higher reward by sending other agents into an area of space that, where you know that they won't um, be able to, to gain as much reward um, as they should be. 
So what is really happening is that the red agent is sending messages to the other agents, telling them that the area that it wants to cover is actually already covered. So very manipulative behavior that has emerged from this data-driven approach to trying to solve um, the problem. And what's interesting is, is that we can take the very same solution deployed on a much, much larger system composed of many more agents and the very same behavior emerges. So the red agent exploiting this manipulative way of communicating again is able to control where the other agents are heading into. So you can see here how it's keeping the whole rest of the swarm in check by sending them into the bottom, bottom left-hand side of, of the area to be covered, whilst it's keeping the top right-hand right side to itself. And this is a result of the learning paradigm that we used called reinforcement learning without controlling the incentives of the agents carefully enough. Now, the good news is that we actually have solutions to this, and we know how, that this, how this adversarial communication emerged, and we can actually counteract it. But what was really interesting to us was we were actually interested in, in analyzing what it was that the agents were actually telling each other and why this adversarial um, um, behavior actually came to be. And so what I'm showing you here in this panel is what we call a post-talk interpretation of the messages sent by the agents. Now, why we need to do this post-talk interpretation is because since the method was devised through a machine learning based approach, we actually, if we interpret the, the base message that is sent, it doesn't really mean much to us because that's just a bunch of numbers. But we can actually devise, uh, um, uh, uh, we can train an, uh, an another uh, model, so an, an analytical model that allows us to visualize what these messages might mean within a domain that is actually meaningful to us. And so what we did here is we plot the messages into the 2D domain to visualize what they are communicating. And what you can see here is that the red agent is actually sending a message that doesn't correspond at all to the ground truth coverage that it has actually executed. So what it has done is it has covered the top left hand side of the area, but what it's telling the other agents that it has done is that it has covered the bottom left hand side of the area. So you see how the red agent has learned to lie in order to manipulate the behavior of the blue agents. And on the right hand side, you can see how the blue agents are being truthful. So the messages that they're conveying corresponds to the ground truth coverage that they have actually executed. So this just proves to us how careful we have to be about how we set up these learning systems to make sure that the communication that emerges and the communication that the agents actually end up executing and deploying amongst each other is contributing, contributing to this higher order goal, this cooperative goal that we set out to design um, at the beginning. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is a problem that um, really lies at the heart of a lot of the research that roboticists are doing today. And we refer to this problem as the sim to real problem, which nothing, means nothing else than how do you transfer an algorithm or a policy that was trained in simulation to the real world? And the reason why this is so difficult is because real world conditions are very different to the conditions that robots encounter during training in simulation. So you might ask me now, okay, so why don't you train your robots in the real world from the outset? And the reason that we don't do that is because we need a lot of training data to, to, to be able to teach the robots what they need to do. And the real world only progresses at real, real time, right? Which is very slow. Whereas simulation, we can run those at a much, much higher speed. And hence the training that we need to do with the robots can happen in a split second. And that is why we train robots in simulation. Also, and, and maybe obviously um, to you, we cannot train robots in the real world if we're trying to do this in safety critical domains such as autonomous driving for example or in domains where humans are involved because we want to train these policies whilst they're immature in simulation settings where nothing bad can happen and so the problem of transferring policies that we reap from simulation 
and transfer them to the real world is a real is a really actual is a really um, concrete problem that we won't get rid of um, um, in in the near future. And so what we're trying to find out is then how do we do it? How do we take a policy that we gained from simulation and how do we transfer it to a robot that runs in the real world so that the robot knows how to how to act with that policy whilst it's encountering situations that it might not have seen before in simulation. And so what we try to understand is, can I take this policy and without much fine tuning, put it onto a real robot and play it and see what happens and hopefully see how the performance of that policy in the real world compares to what we've seen happen in the simulation. And so this is a little bit of um, a glimpse of some of the work we've been doing to show that this indeed can be done. So in this video that I'm showing you here, we have trained a group of five robots to create a formation and then reconfigure that formation to fit through um, a constriction. So they have to navigate through a passageway and rejoin specific destinations on the other hand side of that passageway. Now again, this is a coordination problem that is relatively difficult and you don't necessarily want to design these algorithms by hand. And so having a machine learning based approach to solving this problem is highly attractive. Now, in this scenario, we trained the policy in simulation first, and that is what we're overlaying onto this actual video that you can see here. And we then used that very same policy, deployed it onto these um, real robots here to see how different the performance was once we deployed it onto the real robots. And the good news is that you saw that the simulated policy corresponded very closely to the policy that we're seeing the robots run in this real world setup. And so this is really promising for us because it shows us not only that our policies work in simulation, but that with very, very little additional work, we can make them, these policies work on, on, in the real world as well. And so we're really looking forward to making this idea of machine learning based coordination policies a reality. So this brings my talk to an end and I'd just like to finish off with a couple of points here. So first of all, I hope that I convinced you that using machine learning based approaches and graph neural networks really allows us to develop highly scalable decentralized solutions to solving some of the hardest coordination problems we know to date. And I also hope that I've um, uh, at least made you uh, perceptive of the fact that we have to be careful about how we actually derive these solutions because adversarial communication or non-cooperative policies, policies may emerge unless we design our machine learning paradigms and setups very, very carefully. Now, there are many, many things that are very current and, very, and that I'm very excited about looking forward um, in looking towards the research that I'm doing in my lab within the next few years. And they include things such as explainability and an interpretability of the kinds of so solutions we're developing with um, uh, our algorithms, fairness in how we actually deploy um, our robots um, into the real world, making sure that the workload is, is fairly distributed, and also resilience and robustness against noise, attacks, and non-cooperative policies that they might encounter as they operate in the real world. And so with this, I'd just like to acknowledge my lab and the whole team that has contributed to the work that I showed you today. Um, also acknowledge all my sponsors and funders, and of, of course, all the supporters um, that um, support me in, in this journey towards um, the results that I have presented to you today. And with this, I'd like to wrap up and be more than happy to take any of your questions. Thank you for your attention. All right, so I have um, a couple of questions here that I'm going to answer. So the first question here is, please tell us a bit about how you, you work to remove bias from algorithms. That's a really good question. Um, so I guess this is a very broad question that um, one could address to the machine um, learning community as a whole. Um, in my particular case, bias um, comes up as um, comes up when we use potentially supervised training mechanisms and not necessarily reinforcement learning training mechanisms, although one could argue that it's always, it's also baked into the reinforcement learning rewards that we consider um, as we train our systems. And um, unfortunately, the answer is that there is, there is no 
there is no holy grail um, or there's no one answer to all of these problems in, in terms of how to remove bias. Um, and every time that we deploy a machine learning system, we need to think about the question of removing bias um, in a very application-oriented way. So um, perhaps the question um, of, of how or when we deploy our reinforcement learning algorithms um, is most amenable to this question of how we remove bias. So at that point, we think about, okay, how are we designing our rewards? And are our re rewards free from bias? Now, clearly that is a very difficult question to answer. And um, at that point, we, we, we need to take a step back and consider what are the elements that might contribute to bias if we would deploy these rewards um, onto our robots during their training scheme. Um, as I showed you in the example of um, emergent adversarial communication, um, this kind of thing can happen, and this is perhaps a form of bias that can um, emanate from, from these systems if, if we're not careful. The next question asks, to what extent is, a carbon zero, um, is carbon zero's ethos embedded in these domains being developed? Um, this is a difficult question. I think that, um, so I'm not an expert in um, uh, environmental matters and um, I, to be honest, I don't think we, we are very focused on carbon zero um, in the first instance in the algorithms that we develop. Um, but I arguably think that, uh, I admittedly think that um, taking care of the environment is, is um, or should be a priority and should be integrated into no matter what research domain one is tackling. Um, but we're, in my lab at least, much more focused on the question of how to design algorithms for multi-agent um, problems. And energy is, at this point, um, a secondary issue, um, although arguably a very important one. Um, another question is, once all these systems interlink, how will they be protected from evil agents seeking to wreak havoc, uh, de demand payments for not causing harm or worse? Won't there be more players aware of the system's weaknesses and therefore enhance their capability to be exploited in unwelcome ways, even if the units are decentralized? Um, this is a, a very topical question and relates um, perfectly well to one of, of the research studies that I showed you. So um, there is no way to protect yourself 100% from havoc um, or from manipulating agents um, that are able to gain um, access to your communication channel, for example, but there are protective measures that we can take. And we are wor working really, really hard on this topic of devising robustness layers or resilience layers in order to um, endow our, our, our autonomous agents with the capability of, of trying to introspect what is actually being said to them um, in the communication that they're receiving. And this is definitely a part of my research agenda that we take very seriously. How are you planning to prevent unethical agents from penetrating your companies and gaining access to data and operational protocols and may be hijacked or exploited? Are we in danger of letting the technology get ahead of the associated ethics here? And how do we prevent this from happening? Um, so penetration um, is actually a topic that is as well beyond my research agenda because penetration targets more um, questions of privacy and security, which is important in robotics as a whole, but it does not belong to my lab's research agenda. But I, I think that that is the first um, instance or the first research domain or the, the, the kind of expert I would talk to if I were trying to find a solution against penetration. How do you tackle the problem of persistent existence or non-participating objects when they are no longer visible? For example, a cyclist who temporarily disappears behind a van in autonomous driving. Um, this is a great question. I think that, um, again, we are at the current um, moment not experts in perception for autonomous vehicles. We focus much more on cooperation and coordination algorithms. 
But you'd be happy to hear that there are a lot of people working on this kind of problem. Um, and the way they do this is they try to develop models for the um, dynamics of the objects that are visible within the scene. And they project the, mo the motion or the movement of these objects throughout time. So hence, if, for example, an object has, identified, has been identified as, say, a human or a bicycle, then automatically that object is linked to a motion model that will have a projected trajectory into the future um, uh, uh, time horizon. And hence, the autonomous vehicle will know, even if it's occluded by a van, where that object will be 10 seconds from now. So be it in front of the van or behind the van, it will have a predicted estimate of the position where that object will be located. And so this is how people are tackling that problem. Would this research apply to drones and flying cars? Uh, absolutely. So um, the difference with drones and flying cars is that they operate in three-dimensional domain instead of just a two-dimensional domain. Um, and uh, the, the problem here is absolutely applicable and all the same um, algorithms apply. Um, the only difference being here is that the motion and the configuration space of the robot has uh, w one or several higher uh, degrees of freedom. Um, Please talk a little bit about the impact of 5G, low latency, how bandwidth communication um, will impact your work, and how in a local approach does out-of-sight communication improve performance as each agent is able to communicate with greater numbers of other agents? Um, great question, really, really great question. So absolutely, um, so higher bandwidth, lower latency, impacts our control policies. So we rely upon the fact that these robots are able to communicate with, other, with each other with low latency um, and potentially also high bandwidth. But the latency here is the key issue because control algorithms run at given frequencies. And if communication messages are missed or if they're delayed, this has a significant impact on how the robot is able to act based on the information it already has. So the simple example here is if I'm moving and the information I'm getting is 10 seconds old, then obviously my actions are going to be with respect to some information that is no longer current. And that is not only dangerous, um, but also uh, leads to policies that essentially are meaningless. So improvement of communication infrastructure in the wild and in, 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 in also in urban settings is key to making this, these systems a reality um, to solving real world problems. And we're really looking forward um, to advances in communication technology because this will also trigger a lot of advancements within the domain, the domain and the kind of research things that we're doing. Next question is, are these setups ones with a division of labor between the robots or are they essentially similarly placed participants? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question completely, but maybe let me give it a stab. So it depends what learning paradigms we're using in these systems and it depends on whether we set up these agents as collaborative or cooperative or just simply coordinating because those are three different things. Um, in the example that I showed you with the adversarial communications that was um, essentially emanating or emerging from these systems, our agents weren't trained equally, right? And this was done on purpose to see whether unequal training would elicit differences in their learned policies, where ideally we want to see them cooperate, but giving them the freedom to not cooperate, it, cooperate will tell us more about whether the learning paradigm is adapted to this, to, to this task or not. So we were hoping to see a fair division of labor, but if the machine learning um, paradigm doesn't elicit this, then other things um, tend to happen. In the path planning example that I showed you, this was a pure coordination um, example where the agents don't have an incentive of not cooperating because not getting in each other's way is good for everybody in any case. And so it really depends on the kinds of applications that you're considering and whether or not um, a division of labor will occur naturally or whether it has to be reinforced. Do you have an idea of the timeline to deployment of these algorithms in human systems? Um, so I guess it really depends on what, how you're defining human systems. I would argue that um, the kinds of logistics we're seeing already being deployed by Amazon or Ocado technologies 
our systems that are human systems because we are using them daily or we're taking advantage of the product daily. Um, if, you, if you receive packets through Amazon Prime or you have Okada deliveries at your home, you are a benefactor of these highly automated warehouse systems. Um, and hence, this has already happened. And improving the, the efficiency of these systems beyond what they can do today will happen if we're able to push the boundary on how effective these coordination algorithms are and to what extent we can actually scale them to really, really large systems. And this is how I see the kinds of research projects that we're doing contributing to. Um, do you know how far the development is in usage of robotics in healthcare and the acceptance of them by patients? Um, and this is a comment from somebody in Austria. Yeah, really, really great question. Um, so I, the, the, the domain of robotics in healthcare is a really big one and it's a, a community in its own. My research lab does not um, participate within this domain. Um, but I do know that um, there's a lot of work um, uh, going on in the UK and arguably uh, worldwide. And it's a really important domain because uh, it has been shown that there are th certain things that robots can do um, better than humans. Um, one of the aspects that I think is, is extremely promising is robotic surgery um, because robots don't get tired and they, they, they um, essentially um, depend less on uh, or the problem of human failure is, is, is less current if you have robots um, uh, executing tasks that are extremely concentration heavy for humans. Um, of course, the robots are also being deployed in other areas of health such as um, for um, work with, with children um, that might have, for example, autism, um, and this has been done to great success. And I think that there are certain um, places worldwide where the acceptance of robots within the healthcare domain is quite high. Uh, Japan, for example, is one, one area. Um, I, I think that um, it again will depend very much on what kind of application you're thinking. So if you're a patient that is undergoing surgery, it's a slightly different risk that you're undergoing uh, versus a patient um, that uh, uses robots in a non-invasive way. So um, again, a question that has, has many different answers and it's again, the answers would be uh, very application specific. But as I mentioned before, I'm not, I'm not an expert in, in um, robotics for healthcare. Another great question. So would it be possible to conduct research like this in, the private, in a private sector lab? Um, or does being part of a university confer a particular scope? Um, I, I love this question. Um, so the way I think about research in academia is we try to do things that are high risk. We try to do these um, kinds of things because Typically, that is the kind of project where uh, research in the private sector tends to be, um, it, it's, hard, it's harder to get those projects greenlighted. And within academia, we have the flexibility or even freedom to spearhead blue sky projects or projects that we have, that we don't cer know with certainty will have a positive outcome. And we are able to um, uh, take up this risk because we have, uh, we have the time and the intellectual headspace to think about these problems, which is slightly different in an industrial setting. And this is how I see the juxtaposition between research done in industry versus research uh, done in academia. Then again, it depends um, on what kind of research labs you're operating, but some industrial research labs have different kinds of infrastructure, sometimes much better, sometimes perhaps not as good. And that as well will play an important factor in what kinds of research is more amenable to within academia versus um, industry. Um, there's another question, um, which country is most advanced in this research area? How fast have they been um, deployed in different parts of the world? Um, a very good question. I think uh, that various countries have different academic agendas, different countries put different emphasis on um, different segments of these academic agendas. And so, yes, it does happen that certain um, uh, countries tend to be more advanced in, in certain areas and other countries in other areas. Um, I, I wouldn't like to generalize this. 
Um, perhaps historically Japan has been very strong in, in uh, using robots in healthcare and in interaction with elderly patients because they have um, prioritized the care of elderly since, since a long time already within their program and research agenda nationally. Um, if you think about the UK, the UK tends to be very equally distributed ac across all the various domains where robotics plays a role, um, so automation, healthcare, um, such as surgery, but also deployment into the real world. UK is very strong in autonomous vehicles. So I think um, the answer to this is again very application specific. But there are differences um, as you consider the various countries' um, uh, research agendas and R&D agendas and how the government is supporting that through very specific program grants, um, etc. There's, there's another interesting question, um, um, kind of reinforcing the point on climate change, um, uh, really emphasizing the point that we really must um, consider climate change, and, and, I, and I agree 100%. And, um, you know, at, at sometimes I wish that academic agendas could um, uh, pivot much quicker, but obviously what I think um, you, you have to appreciate as well is that sometimes in academia one has uh, one has program grants that are tied to certain proposals that we wrote and we have certain momentum in our agendas and we have deliverables that we have to deliver according to the agendas that we laid out when we proposed them to our funders. Um, and hence it takes time until we can incorporate new objectives, new goals, new urgencies even into these agendas. Um, and I think um, that is something that perhaps uh, is, is less, less known to the public, how, how um, research is funded in academia. And sometimes a lot of countries are actually very nimble and they react very quickly to urgent matters. I think we saw that brilliantly in the case of COVID. There were a lot of funds um, available to people studying um, within, within the, the domain of healthcare, um, allowing people or researchers to devise their research plans according to what was really important at that moment in time. Um, and uh, this very same manner of operating is valid uh, in domains um, such as robotics with respect to goals such as climate change. And I have time, I believe, for one more question. Um, Wonderful question to, to wrap the session up with. Where, what do you envision the robotic world will look like um, one decade, in one decade's time and one, in, in one century from now? Um, so my ideal scenario is that there will be robots uh, deployed in a pervasive manner and that these robots will not necessarily take the form of what we think these robots look like today. Um, they might be hidden, they might be integrated into other consumer electronics, they might be in our cars, in our homes, but the most important thing to me is that the robots run, run policies that allow them to cooperate, coordinate and collaborate with all the other devices within their network. And that is really what my research mission is trying to contribute to. With that, I'm closing the session and thank you very much for your attention.